Well, good morning. Welcome to all of our participants this morning. Um, we are now in the fourth Reading Bart Together webinar, uh, moving right through Dogmatics and Outline onto his discussion of the third article, um, The Holy Spirit and Following. Um, so just a few logistical points. As always, we'll have the Q&A open and running throughout. And I invite the participants to keep an eye on that um, as we're going through so that if you see questions that look exciting and interesting that you want to hear answered, um, we can cover those at the end. And then Andy has posted a short link um, in the Q&A also to his discussion group. If you would like to keep talking Bart after 11 o'clock, you can do that with him at that link. And so without further ado, I'll turn it over to- Great. Thank you so much, Karsten, for facilitating all this and managing the website during these. We're on the third article of the Creed, beginning with uh, the coming of Jesus Christ as judge. Uh, I must say, as a kid, I remember when we said the Apostles' Creed in church, and uh, it said, he sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Uh, it makes Jesus, the ascended one, seem like he's basically resting. Uh, Bart opens with, he came, he sitteth at the right hand of God, and he shall come again. Maybe this is trivial insight, but uh, it impresses me that the Christ as judge being rendered here is in movement, in motion. One of the great Bart slogans that I like is uh, uh, God never rests. And so that interests me in this first acclamation of judge. What interests you, Stanley? Uh, that point about God never rests is, um, I think Bart, of course, is oftentimes seen as making no metaphysical claims at all, but that God never rests is a way of maintaining that God is not just pure substance, but rather God is activity in which the love that makes God our Father through Jesus Christ is always a movement that is fulfilled in God's own life. So that um, Bart is making these kinds of claims, I think are close to Aquinas's views about only in God are essence and existence one, because both essence and existence are activity in which the life of the Trinity is manifest and making our lives possible. And that's why uh, he also, in this uh, chapter, gives such an account of time that uh, we, um, we live in a new time, uh, thanks to Christ. So time is not just one damn thing after another. You know, when he said, I'm going to talk about time, I kind of gasped, uh, having been the victim of some of Augustine's, uh, well, deep ruminations about time. Well, he, he kind of, time for him is presence. He, he uses that word a lot in this thing, presence and activity of God, that our time has now been taken, uh, is now where uh, God is at work. Um, let, let me toot yeah. my own horn. I think I have a nice chapter on that in the work of theology called How, How to Tell Time Theologically, I think. Okay. The work of theology that's published by Erdman's. Uh, yes, right. Wonderful uh, series of essays there. The world is not abandoned, uh, he says here, which to me kind of sums up his notion of time. We live in a time of non-abandonment of presence. Uh -huh. And uh, 
also the preacher in me, like, he also used the word exist a lot, that Christ is a fact as an existence um, that changes time. And then I love, and I, I love where he says, um, this exists, and he italicizes exist, quite independently of whether or not we believe it or not. And somehow for me, that is, was an important sentence that our believing and our assent is not that which makes God, God. You don't do God, you know. Um, I remember when I was a kid uh, and I was, um, I think a sophomore in college, maybe junior, um, Buttrick came to give a series of, um, of lectures. And um, the I- The older Buttrick, George Buttrick? The older Buttrick. Yeah, yeah. And I went in, um, smart ass that I was, and said, um, I, um, I don't believe in God. I give you five minutes to convince me. And, oh, wow. And Buttrick said, well, maybe God doesn't want you to believe in God. <laughs> <laughs> that was I love it. I was I was really I was rather taken aback. I thought me. I mean, God surely wants me. Yeah. <laughs> but that was a lovely. I know. Uh, I remember uh, growing up, uh, uh, evangelical preachers. Some of uh, you should always preach for a verdict. You need the readers to make a verdict. Uh -huh. And I hear Bart saying, "Who cares?" <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I remember being at a youth rally and the uh, alleged youth pastor said, now we're only here tonight for one important reason, for you to make a decision for Jesus Christ. And uh, the person leaning next to me said, let me get this straight. Jesus is dependent on a 16 year old <laughs> fighting for him. Do you know some of the stupid decisions 16 year olds make? Uh, so I love that sentence. Uh, God exists, and it just, um, uh, I think too here should be mentioned that behind this is one of the things you pointed out in a number of places, and that is um, for Bart um, to say he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty does mean his work is done, it is finished, and there's nothing awaiting our uh, addition to that, completion of that, contribution to that. And I think um, unwittingly, a lot of American evangelical Christianity made Christ work conditional on our decision, on our faith and all. And uh, Bart really wants to say, no, you can relax. You can enjoy the present time. It's not a time of striving towards God. It's a time when God said, it's finished. We, we've, I've done it. I thought that he didn't develop as he might what it meant for be, Jesus to be the judge politically, uh, having just uh, left Nazi Germany in terms of the political implications that Jesus mm. sitting at the right hand of the Father means that um, political um, uh, regimes are always under question. He mm. doesn't develop that uh, that much. Uh, that's true. I, I do. He, he is careful. Uh, but he, he says one way in his, one of his letters that, you know, standing there at Bonn in the ruins of the university all around him, a sense that uh, God's judgment, God as judge, was so physically apparent, and I, and I wonder if maybe he he doesn't need to develop judgment because well, that's quite possible. hey, look, we're we're in the rubble now. I also think he wants to be careful about um, uh, that that this notion that okay, the Nazis are gone, we're okay. Uh, yeah, think things so. things are over, and he doesn't want to let the German church off the hook. Uh, I went back and I and this morning I was reading Eberhard Bush's 
in the biography account of the German church struggle. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, he was so unbelievably active uh, in uh, opposing uh, the German yeah. Christians. And uh, I mean, so one, it's not like he, he hadn't uh, paid the price that. Uh, Absolutely. And he, he would, there's probably too strong a statement, but he, he believed the German Christians um, were a, a kind of more insidious threat and sign than Hitler. That, you know, one, one, the Hitlers come and go, but when God's people sell out and bless, that's particularly troubling. The, um, uh, I think, I mean, uh, Burkhauer's old book, uh, The Triumph of Grace and the Work of Karl Barth, is being centered here. And um, um, Jerry McKinney's uh, terrific book on Barth also emphasizes the sovereignty of God's grace. Um, and I think what that does, and, and it's not to be missed, is to uh, relativize sin. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I think as that uh, that I always say the revivalistic accounts of Christianity in the South made the grammar of the faith inappropriate because when you were in the tent, um, the evangelists had to convince you that you were a sinner and then you might try on Jesus. Bart, mm -hmm. once the claim is Jesus is not to be uh, determined by our sin in terms of what is. Absolutely. And, and Bart was always accused of, quote, not taking sin seriously. Uh, and he's, he said, you know, the trick is to take sin with absolute seriousness and with absolute conviction that it has been defeated, been defeated. In, the, in the work of Christ. He was, he was upset with Burkhauer, that triumph of grace in the theology of Karl Barth book. Uh, but he wasn't, he wasn't upset in that a, a real triumph has been worked, but it's not a triumph of grace. It's a triumph of Jesus Christ. Right. And, and speaking of grace is the way Methodists generally all speak of grace these days as some kind of a detached uh, disposition. Do you remember uh, the time I got in trouble when I was doing some, I can't remember, uh, event for Methodists and, and I was uh, challenged that my position didn't sound like it was very uh, graceful. And I responded by saying, grace sucks. <laughs> uh, yeah, that made, that caused comment. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, hey, we got the Holy Spirit next. Uh, uh, and uh, the Holy Ghost. Uh, and there, one, noted, one word that I notice uh, reoccurring is, is the word freedom. I would say uh, for Bart, the Holy Spirit's work is to enable us to be free to hear the gospel. Right. Is that an adequate well, uh, characterization? I think, I, think, I think so. He, he says on 139, and now thirdly, I should like to say that the fact that there are Christians, men, who have this freedom is no lesser miracle than the birth of Jesus Christ or the Holy Spirit, <laughs> the Virgin Mary, or the creation of the world out of nothing. <laughs> That's great. Uh, I, it, it's just, you know, the way I as a preacher hear that is when anybody comes out and says, hey, I heard something today. Bart says, good, it's the virgin birth and the creation of the world all over again. Here uh -huh. we go. And uh, it, it is miraculous. That is, it is exclusively divinely produced. Uh, back to your comment about Buttrick, uh, I would, I think for us preachers, you know, why is it that some hear and some don't? Well, in a sense, I, I think Bart would say, would well, you have to take that up with the Lord? I, you know, that's the Lord's work. And, uh, uh, 
you know. It was interesting. I'm, years ago when we did Preaching to Strangers. Yeah. I mean, that was a constant dialectic that was involved in that. I, it was. I went back and had a chance to look at that uh, Preaching to Strangers as one of our first, maybe it was the first collaboration uh, we did. But uh, that, that, and, you know, and preaching is a university, in a university chapel to a bunch of strangers and people passing through and all. It was, I thought belatedly, a kind of demonstration of this Bardian thing about, hey, your job is to say it, speak it. Uh, it's the Holy Spirit's job uh, to enable hearing, uh, to choose, to elect who will hear and who doesn't hear. Uh, that's kind of nice because when people come out and say, I didn't get anything out of your sermon, you mm -hmm. can say, uh, take it up with the Lord, okay? I, I, you know, <laughs> I did my job. <laughs> I, um, uh, I, in the little book that you and I wrote on the Holy Spirit. Uh, published by Abingdon. Yeah, the, the yeah. First, <laughs> I think the first sentence that we said, the Holy Spirit is God. <laughs> um, that, yeah, that, that's oftentimes forgotten because people want to make the Holy Spirit the subjective uh, appropriation of something called God that the Holy Spirit somehow isn't. <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, that's where Bart in this chapter gets into the the Holy Spirit is not the human spirit. Okay. Uh, and I'd say too, along with that, I, th I think you're absolutely right. The, the, the Holy Spirit language too easily slides into just uh, contemporary subjectivity. But, but also the Holy Spirit um, often is described as some sort of impersonal power, uh, some force, the force be with you. Uh, and Bart would know the Holy Spirit is God. Jesus I always, Christ. I always think of the Eisenheim um, uh, triplet um, because the Holy Spirit has a job, and that's to point to Jesus, and that's John the Baptist's long finger. Uh, and yeah, and, I mean that's. Uh, that's we we funny. say in our book on the Holy Spirit, we use that great Gene Rogers insight about what's the job of the Holy Spirit. It rests on bodies. bodies. It rests on Jesus' bodily form uh, in his baptism, and it rests upon his body, the church. Uh, I hear Bart wanting to stress uh, the freedom. And, and, and it's interesting, freedom for what? Freedom to hear. Right. Freedom, freedom to say yes. Uh, it's interesting. I'm, I'm, I've wondered, I mean, hearing is such a central motif for Bart, and um, seeing is a motif is a central motif for me. And uh, I I don't Bart doesn't use the language of seeing that much. He uh, doesn't. And I'm I'm I enjoy art, and I think of myself as a visual person, and it troubles me that Bart is uh it is it is the word and it is hearing and it is speaking and the most interesting thing he hears it, about god is god speaks uh, god reveals I, I mean it's it's not an either or i mean my you know off made claim you can only act in a world you can see yeah you can only see by learning to say um and I think that's right. So Bart is about training and saying, but um, mm -hmm. one, one would like to have had him develop uh, a bit more what scene. Would you, um, would you, your speak of visibility may be a segue into 22, uh, where he stressed, uh, stresses the the church as visible, the essential Absolutely. visibility, corporality of, of the church. Uh, I love this sentence here. 
And uh, by, here, uh, today there is rather too much than too little said about the church. There is something better. Let us be the church. And he italicizes be. And at some point in my life, I have written Hauerwas next to that sentence. Now, why did I write that? I guess because of my claim, the first task of the church is not to make the world more just, but to make the world the world. <laughs> and the very, and so my claim is, it's not that what is crucial for our salvation is the very existence that there is something called church, even in its unfaithfulness, that it points back to itself, makes mm -hmm. the world the world, because the world cannot know it is the world unless there's some contrast. Okay. And um, and of course that that doesn't mean you can't forget that the church is is the earnest of the kingdom of God. So it's not like that. Christians have a, a purchase on the kingdom in a way that um, excludes others, but rather that how Christians discover the embodiment of God in our lives is an illumination of how God is determined to save all people. I like the way Bonhoeffer says, uh, the church is Jesus Christ taking up room right. <laughs> in the world. He, he, is, he is the bodily phys Uh I wonder, did I write your name next to this though, because of the way that begins the first sentence, today there is rather too much than too little said about the church. Uh, your theology is, <laughs> is an ecclesiology. Uh, you, you, link ethics. A church say something political and we say church. Um, do you think Bart, um, well, I, I wondered what, what, what would you say to Bart if Bart said to you, gosh, I, you're, you're, you're making way too much out of the church. Um, as, I think, I think Bart Bart was still operating within a Christendom world. So he just assumed the church was there. And you could then say it ought to do this X or Y. In a way we cannot. We cannot. Mm -hmm. The church isn't there. And therefore, my emphasis recognizes that it's time that we have to do some um, heady reclaiming of the centrality of the church. The, I mean, the first, for me, the first move ecclesiologically is to remind you that Mary is the first born of the new creation. She is the church. And the very fact that Mary now stays present in the church's witness to the one who she bore is, I think, absolutely crucial for reclaiming exactly what Bart wants, the visibility of the church. That, of course, the invisibility of the church is the kind of Lutheran distinction between visibility and <laughs> invisibility that Bart he, had to stand against. He calls it on page uh, 142, cloud cuckoo land. Right. <laughs> uh, all this talk about invisibility. Uh, and, I mean, it doesn't get stronger if the church has not this visibility, then it's not the church. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's uh, the whole, kind of the whole point is the visibility, which I think, by the way, surely we've got a lot of pastors uh, listening in on this. I think that's very important for pastors to hear that all of the body stuff they do with their lives, uh, going to meetings, planning, preparing, uh, convening, uh, calling, touching base and all. Uh, I think Bart would say uh, that, uh, good for you. That That's that's God's work. That is, uh, that, that is, the visibility of the church. 
taking form. Crucial here is the recognition that without the church, there's no salvation. Um, I think evangelicalism in America is so subject to accommodationist strategies because it is assumed that salvation is a relation between the individual and God, which, which they go to church to have expressed. The idea that you would not know what salvation looks like without the church, because salvation is fundamentally to be incorporated into a community which is no longer determined by um, the temptations of control that so possess us as a way to try to free ourselves from death, that therefore what Bart is doing is moving fairly close to a more determinative Catholic ecclesiology, which um, assumes that the church is the embodiment of our salvation. How do you, uh, uh, on like page 143, uh, how do you reconcile that uh, robust uh, Catholic uh, ecclesiology with Bart's talk of the church being an event? Um, I've been critical of that language for a long time until I finally realized once reading the dogmatics of that he uses event to say, this is God showing up. So it doesn't mean occasionalistic, God shows up here, God shows up there. Uh, there might now be and a conversation right, uh, between them. But event is um, the name of how the description requires that God be the God of Jesus Christ, or it's all darkness. So event is his way of saying, we must describe this as God's work. And that is not subject to um, cause and effect uh, determination because mm. God is pure activity. Mm -hmm. It. Uh... I have been attracted to the, the the church as an event. To me, it it points it it points to the dependency of the church upon God to convene the church. Right. Uh, that's one word he uses uh, there. Uh, I, I heard from a pastor the other day that with a pandemic. He was saying, I, I really feel my congregation is disintegrating uh, before me. They got a lot of older people and all, but he said not only that, but the fear of reconvening and everything. And, um, uh, and I've heard that from a number of pastors recently, but he, he said, uh, I'm afraid uh, God is uh, uh, pushing me and my ministry into what I don't want to do evangelism. I'm going to have to go out and find out where God is active. And it was so much easier keeping house here at the church. Anyway, that that seemed to me a kind of Bardian eventuality kind of notion that, uh, that ch church is what God does. And, and, but along with the affirmation, hey, God does. <laughs> God convenes. Uh, and I can remember in my better moments, like standing on the steps of Duke Chapel on a Sunday morning and thinking, I can name you 10 reasons, documentable good reasons why nobody should be here this morning, uh, why there shouldn't be a church here. It's just too odd, too crazy. And yet, hear people streaming in. Uh, and I said, I, I really don't have many reasons for that. Uh, other than God, so I um, I think we can't um, have this session without 
um, saying something about Donald Trump's claim that um, Sunday, this last Sunday, everyone is to return to church um, uh, because uh, they, that's where people are comforted, uh, either that or the synagogue or the mosque. Uh, I mean, you know you're in trouble when you have a, um, uh, someone like uh, Trump uh, telling uh, you that he's evangelizing for uh, the, the, the church um, in that way. Um, because it's an accommodationist um, account yeah. of uh, who we are. If, um, I mean, Trump is a long way from the Nazis, but um, you, you got to hear at least some of the worry <laughs> that um, resulted in Barman. Well, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say, but well, since you mentioned Barman, in that Trump dynamic, uh, it's one thing for him to be, uh, you know, our first kind of pagan president in a long time. But uh, the fact that there are Christians who can find rationale for defending him right. as a Christian <laughs> and, and that, that he is somehow representing Christian concerns seems to me more troubling than he and his family. I think... I mean, his father and he, if they went to church, they went to Norman Vincent Peale's <laughs> uh, a church in New York City. And I think that that is an indication of how, as Christians, we've been too easy on one another, just to the extent that we let Norman Vincent Peale get away with claiming that he represents normative Christianity across the centuries. Yeah. Well, I'm, I've tried to do my little part not to be easy on Albert Moeller or Rusty Reno. And so uh, my, uh, the, uh, uh, I, um, just before we leave the event talk to say that I think it is salubrious for church officials like me to keep being reminded that that this is this is a work of God and not my hard work, my faithful work, my uh, and that uh, this that and Bart wants to celebrate, and it may be your, your comment about Bart's lack of, of concern about ecclesiology and all, it may mean that this is related to Bart's lack of concern about sin, et cetera. He is just so convinced of the total victory of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ's constant revelatory activity uh, that we do not have cause for anxiety or concern about the future. In fact, he's got a great quote about that I love about, uh, hey, the church is unfaithful. And then again, it becomes faithful. Uh, the church is judged and uh, condemned and the church uh, rises again and the, the church is attacked. And sometimes the attacks are very, uh, effective, uh, but uh, you have nothing to concern yourself about the church's ultimate uh, existence. How do you think, Will, uh, that famous phrase that he used um, in relationship to um, the Nazi takeover in 33, we must go on as if nothing has happened? Oh gosh, I'd be, I want to hear what you think, but I, I, my my thinking is uh, that uh, where he says, uh, in our justifiable condemnations and concerns, we must be careful not to give evil any undue sovereignty or glory, and. Uh, uh, that's one reason I have not mentioned Trump in sermons, except for maybe 20 or 30 times. 
No. Uh, because, and, and you do, you, and I, I've, I've talked with pastors and said, you know, you, you want to take the, the sin and the evil with appropriate seriousness. On the other hand, you don't want to imply that we are at a decisive juncture where Jesus Christ is being and his purposes are being defeated. But how, how would you think about that? I think he didn't want um, to uh, let uh, the German crisis um, to distract from the uh, centrality of what Christ has done through crucifixion and resurrection. And uh, therefore, uh, he wasn't going to let um, uh, the agenda be shaped by uh, what had happened in 33. It's so important. Uh, uh, you know, Barman has been criticized for not being, quote, political enough and direct enough. I think it's wonderful as a preacher to note that Barman, the Barman Declaration is a declaration about preaching. Nobody can tell the church what to preach. Nobody uh, can outside, you know, Jesus Christ is the one word of God. That's the only word, one word of God at which we must speak. And uh, therefore the church is often in a dilemma I know I uh, tuned in to a distinguished uh, church. Uh, I, I think it was a Sunday after Easter and the preacher begins, today is an important day. Today is Earth Day. Uh, 50 years ago, the Environmental Protection Agency, you know, and I thought, ah, oh, what is the price we pay for uh, giving too much homage to the world, but being politically correct. Oh, you would not have begun a sermon that way? No, I don't think so. <laughs> and, uh, uh, forgiveness of sins, uh, 23. Uh, the uh, you is on 151. You, oh man, with your sin belong utterly at Jesus Christ's property to the realm of the inconceivable mercy of God. Uh, once, when Barr talks about sin, he doesn't want to give sin any authority or power. Sin is kind of stupidity, uh, not to believe the good news. Uh, and that person saying that in one of the dogmatics, I can't remember which one. It's yeah, close to I, I don't either. Uh, the uh, and this earned Bart the criticism of not taking sin seriously, uh, and but he also has contempt for all versions of Christian of the of preaching in the gospel that kind of begin with our sin and then move to Jesus. Bart says you begin with Jesus because you don't know what sin is. Yeah, but you only know sin on your way out of it. Okay, nice, nice quote, uh, nice statement. Yeah, that, um, that um, people, sin is not um, doing something wrong or bad. Sin is to be possessed in a manner that makes our faithfulness to God impossible. So uh, sin um, is, the first sin is the presumption that you can name your sin. Mm. And that's the reason why you need to be part of a people that can tell you where you got it wrong. He makes statements in the dogmatics like only Christian sin or right. the sins of non-Christians are so uninteresting. And uh, he's got a great, in his uh, discussion of David and Bathsheba, 
and he talks about David uh, uh, seeing her at her bath and 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 committing his terrible deeds. And uh, Bart said, one would have expected uh, a more interesting sin uh, from the great David. And yet it's all so mechanical. It is so predictable. And uh, he just, he has sort of contempt for, hey, David, that's the best you could do, <laughs> is uh, just petty lust. And um, I, I think, um, a, a great challenge for Christians is to take sin in, in appropriate ways. Uh, I know uh, uh, the progressive preacher who recently said, if you're not attacking the Trump administration in every single sermon, you shouldn't be preaching. And I would think Bart would say, hey, look, this too shall pass. Come on. Uh, so. Um, we need to do resurrection. OK, life. please move to it. Yeah, quickly move out of sin <laughs> go to the victory. Um, what uh, interests you about the resurrection in Bart's account here in 24? Well, one, it's short. <laughs> he was running out of time. And, okay. Uh, and I think, um, I mean, we've just had the ascension and um, that Christ bodily was among us for 40 days before he ascended and he ascended bodily mm -hmm. um, makes us have to think about what we mean by body. Hmm. And um, uh, I think the spiritualization of the gospel is um, one of developments, particularly in modernity, that has made the presentation of what it means to be a Christian uh, extremely problematic. So uh, I think um, where, where he says in the middle of 154, resurrection means not the continuation of this life, but of life's completion. To this man, a yes is spoken, which is a shadow of death cannot touch. In resurrection, our life is involved. We men and we are and are situated. We rise again. We rise again with the body that we have trouble uh, conceiving and we rightly have trouble conceiving because it is going to be uh, a special gift of God. Mm. Uh, yeah, the, the Christian looks forward and he talks about eschatology there, uses the word. Uh, I would commend to people if they don't, haven't seen it, Bart's funeral sermon for the death of his son, Matthias, is... Oh, I read that. I oh, really? Oh, uh, it, it's, I, I think you'd find it moving. And uh, uh, whether you found it moving or not, it's still true. <laughs> uh, but there he manages to speak about his, the death of his son, I think in a wonderfully bodily way but also moving on to the, uh, and, and noting what a complete tragedy it is, uh, moving on to uh, an affirmation of, of the victory. It, uh, one thing that really concerns me uh, is the, the low quality of, of many funeral sermons that I hear, and um, the, the sense that uh, here is an opportunity for the church to speak of the hope that we have, and, uh, and, and yet the hope that is offered is usually not this eschatological resurrection hope, but many other godless hopes. I wanted to read a quote from Bart. 
is it was it's from Bush's biography. How do I know whether I shall die easily or with difficulty? I only know that my dying too is part of my life. And then this is the destination, the limit and the goal of all of us. I shall no longer be, I shall be made manifest before the judgment seat of Christ and in with my whole being, with all the real good and the real evil which I have brought, said and done with all the bitterness that I have suffered and all the beauty I've enjoyed. There I shall only be able to stand as failure that I doubtlessly was in all things, but by virtue of his promise and his peccator justus, and as, and as that I shall be able to stand, then in the light of grace, all that is now dark will become very clear. That's, mm. that's as he tore it, he was an ill towards the end of his life when he wrote that. Uh, he has a statement on 154, resurrection means not the continuation of this life, but life's completion. We shall be changed. Uh, he, yeah. doesn't, nice. he doesn't speculate about that, and that's right. You don't speculate. Mm -hmm. it, it seems to me very Pauline. Um, and I wonder, I think you're right, that he's running out of time here, and he's uh, got a... On the other hand, Bart, it was noted how little he does with the cross to be such a Pauline person uh, uh, throughout his theology, and that I, I just think Bart was so convinced that that the resurrection permeates every word we're able to say about God. We're we're only able to say anything because of the resurrection. And um, that maybe, so we get to the end and then like we've been, we've been saving the resurrection to the end that makes it all come together, that the resurrection is from the first on. But. Yeah, before opening the questions. Yeah. Um, it's just dogmatics and outline, I hope um, we've, convinced some it's just such a remarkable book because of how uh, in effect uh, it's a transformation of how we speak through taking us through exercises of the fundamental commitments of the faith that um, help us see the world that was transformed by resurrection and uh, in that sense, I just think it's um, uh, a kind of miracle <laughs> that you that you couldn't have anticipated. It, dang, that's a good uh, benediction there on the uh, uh, one of the biggest challenges, and it was one that I, when I encountered dogmatics and outline as a college sophomore, um, I did not see that I did not know enough to know that this little book is uh, an attack on two centuries worth of Christian theology. Uh, and that, and it continues to be relevant in that way that he is trying to get us to re, uh, to redescribe uh, what, where we are to teach us how to talk Christian, as you have said in a good essay. Uh, uh, Karsten, uh, what what are some of the issues people are raising? Yeah, so um, much to my delight, the issue that people want to hear about is Bart and universalism, which seems to me to be a great question. When he, he concludes, um, since we may receive the testimony of the Lord's Supper, we already live here and now in anticipation of the eschaton, when God will be all in all which you know was um, that verse, 1 Corinthians 15, 28, was uh, Gregor of Nyssa's and Origen's favorite one to go to to defend the doctrine of apocatastasis. And yet back in the uh, page of, or the chapter on Christ the Judge, he emphatically says that that does not lead to apocatastasis. 
So can he you does say, say a little bit about BART as a universalist or maybe not? Stanley? Uh, BART's a universalist <laughs> because, <laughs> because um, there's nothing anyone can do to make uh, the salvation wrought in Christ not effective. And um, that's um, a given that uh, means that um, uh, Christ won and uh, there's no going back. What do you think, Will? I like that. I would agree. One of the favorite Bart sermons uh, is from his prison sermons. Uh, deliverance of captives. The sermon is all, where he just says all. And he says in the sermon, can you understand all? Uh, he did not die for a few. Uh, he did not rise to a few. All, all. And, um, you know, Wesley was accused of being a universalist. And Wesley uh, try, defended himself. Uh, I must say, with, with Wesley, uh, Wesley was just so convinced of the power of God working in us, in all people, uh, that that universalism is is, is there. And uh, I just had a great uh, dialogue with an evangelical scholar on this, and he said, uh, to his shame, American evangelicals, Bart will never condemn enough people to suit American evangelicals liking Bart. Uh, he, uh, not enough people will fry to ever bring him in. And uh, then I love uh, I did that Bart uh, quote where the uh, dear person comes up to him in Chicago and says, Dr. Bart, do you, do you think we will one day get to see our loved ones in heaven? And he said, oh, I do, I do. And everybody you hate. <laughs> I always love um, the uh, evangelical, I think from Canada, um, asked Bart, uh, when were you saved? And Bart's response was 33 AD. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, uh, and I, uh, as I remember, Richard John Newhouse did a beautiful essay at uh, up, up from a sermon on this, and he was, he quotes from First Timothy, and uh, God desires that all be saved, and and saying that, uh, and Han, ha, uh, von Balthasar talks about Bart, that uh, this is our hope, and if it isn't your hope, you need to check out your theology. So uh, I say we can hope for universalism, and uh, but I, um, I, I don't want us to end without recommending uh, Bart's The Humanity of God because the essays in that book are so powerful. Mm, and, okay. And where, because what Bart does is challenge the presumption, you know what you say when you say God, because he says, in the mirror of the humanity of Jesus Christ, the humanity of God in, um, enclosed in his deity reveals itself. Thus God is as he is. He affirms the human. He is concerned about the human. He stands up for the human. The God of Schleiermacher cannot show mercy. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob can and does. So um, what is challenged is the presumption that God is just the most powerful thing there is. Mm -hmm. but it's, God's not a thing. <laughs> God yeah. is most present in cross and resurrection. Mm -hmm. That's God. Now that takes some yeah. thinking. Carson, have you got others? Yeah, the people are also worried um, that Bart's uh, sliding into pneumatomachianism, that he's not doing enough to talk about the divinity of the Holy Spirit. Um, I know, it seemed to me like y'all's defense of the Spirit was maybe even a little stronger than Bart's. Can y'all talk about sort of that, mm. the way the Spirit gets eclipsed in Bart's theology in general? Um, 
especially like in just at a level of page count where the spirit gets four and the sun gets um, six dozen. Um, he's pretty uh, straightforward about the second article determining the first and third. Um, and uh, there's a famous essay by Robert Jensen, you wonder where the spirit went that um, uh, criticizes Bart for not having a developed enough account of the Holy Spirit. Uh, in general, it is assumed that the Holy Spirit has gotten the short end of the stick in general in most modern theology. Um, I don't know if that's true or not. Um, um, when I was uh, reading for Will and Molly's book on the Holy Spirit, I was impressed by uh, uh, people like McClendon, Jensen, and others that uh, give a really very rich account of the Holy Spirit. And I think Bart's not very far from that. He also, when he, he speaks of Jesus Christ as man of the spirit, and that uh, to me, the, the Chalcedonian pattern, as George Hunsinger has called it in Bart, uh, you, it, it's very hard to detaching uh, persons of the Trinity. Uh, but I, I can imagine how some of that criticism is justified. Can we have one more? Sure. Um, so with this being Pentecost Sunday coming up, mm. there are some questions, um, well, especially in the the spirit coming on Pentecost. What, what do you think Bart would preach on Pentecost Sunday 2020? Mm. What, what would he make of Acts 2 um, here in a few days? Um, well, I think the temptation is to make the church um, um, multicultural and don't we celebrate our differences in Acts 2, following on Acts 2, when in fact we ought to say salvation comes from the Jews. As uh, Peter's sermon at the end of Act, uh, there, after the descent of the Spirit, he explains it as, hey, this is what Israel had hoped for, is hoping for, and now it is now. And, uh, you know, judging from dogmatics and outline, I would say freedom. Uh, it's interesting this, you know, occurs when during a weekend, we're told, uh, uh, you know, we, we have a military that preserves our freedom and all. It, because Bart and Dog Max and Outline stresses the Holy Spirit is the source of true freedom and the only freedom. And, uh, and maybe freedom to hear, which you can loop back to Acts 2. How come we hear in our own tongue? Uh, how come suddenly and i love it uh at the end of uh, after the spirit descends peter comes out and preaches the same peter who could not preach uh to the serving maid uh, there on monday thursday but uh he comes out and uh, he says we're not drunk um and and he preaches one of the worst sermons in scripture uh short uh no illustrations connections anything and and thousands show up to be sent. They said, what can we do to get in on this? And uh, so he baptizes thousands. Uh, and I, I think Bart would say, uh, yeah, you're going to get that kind of wild kind of stuff with Holy Spirit. It, it does say to me, uh, don't worry too much if you preach. Uh, uh, the Holy Spirit has not been defeated yet by the worst of preaching. The, the Holy Spirit is free to make even your bad sermon on Pentecost. Uh, you know, be prepared for 2000. Uh, well, uh, 
Thanks, everybody. And let me just say that our next session will be next Tuesday. And then we're going to bring in some colleagues to talk about the pastoral practical implications. I don't want to put it like that because I bet Stanley doesn't like it. Stanley okay. actually thinks the most practical thing we can do is to talk about theology. But uh, to talk about how this, uh, how Bard has impacted uh, their ministries and might be a word for the church today. So it'll be a time to have a more general discussion and maybe also uh, a time when we can uh, get to more questions and interaction. And uh, if we could close in prayer, Lord Jesus, we give thanks that in every time and place, you did not leave your church without witnesses to your peculiar living truth. Particularly, we thank you for Karl Barth, who made being Christian as difficult as you mean it to be. We praise you for still speaking through him to us, for using his full flawed humanity to speak to us a word we could not hear were it not for his speaking. Forgive us for our paltry witness. Strengthen us to be bold in our announcement of your victory and your reign. We pray that Stanley's surgery uh, tomorrow will go well. We pray for all pastors who must lead your church at this time and pray that you will give them a word to speak to their people. Thank you for your glorious turn toward us. We thank you that you did not wait for us to come to you, but you came and sought us out in the far country. For your condescension to us that showed us your great glory. We give thanks. Amen. Amen. See you next week. <laughs>